just to make sure that we're all good. Um, I think you can hear me, right? Everybody can hear me? OK. Father Michael? Can you hear me if I talk like this? Great. Testing, and testing, one, two, three. OK, I think we're good. Okay. We're good to go. Uh, so the topic for this morning is why come to church? <laughs> Which is a, preaching to the choir a little bit because you all are here and that's wonderful. But it also, I think, uh, begs asking, why, do, why are we here? Why are we here? Just to kind of remind ourselves. So a long time ago, or not a long time ago, but once upon a time uh, in a land far, far away, uh, Russia to be specific, in a small village in Russia, there was a monastery there and there was a young monk in this monastery who was just starting out and he was very excited about praying and being a monk and um, he went to do an errand for the monastery. He was supposed to pick up a bag of wheat from one of the villagers in the monastery. So he visits the villager to pick up the wheat and he stays with the villager. And this villager happened to have a very large family, something like seven or eight children. And it was like chaos inside of the villager's house. Kids were running around, things were being thrown, food was being thrown left and right. And the young monk who was just starting out and was very excited about being a monk was somewhat scandalized. But it wasn't until he was about to go to sleep when he saw the older villager going to bed and he saw him, he made the sign of the cross and then he just collapsed on his bed. <laughs> and that was all he did for his evening prayers. And the young monk is thinking, oh boy, and we're getting wheat from this guy for the monastery. This is really scandalous. So he goes back to the monastery and he goes to the abbot and he says, abbot, we have to stop getting our wheat from this man. He barely prays. His house is a mess. All of the kids running around and the abbot looks at him and kind of thinks for a second. He says, you know what? I want you to do something for me. He says, take this oil lamp. So it was a, a you know, a little glass uh, with some oil in it, with a little candle uh, inside of the oil. And he says, I want you to take this without spilling any of the oil and walk around to the, to, uh, in the entire circumference of the village and come back to the monastery without having spilled any of the oil. Okay? And he says, okay, I'll do that. So you see him walking through. This is actually from a little short film. You can find it online. You see him walking through the village and different villagers are coming up to him and talking to him and he's starting to get distracted and he's almost about to spill it, but he doesn't spill it and he makes it all the way around the village and comes back to the monastery and the abbot says, ah, you made it without having spilled any of the oil. Congratulations. And the, the young monk is very proud and excited that he did that. And the abbot says, and how much did you pray when you were doing that? And then his face sort of drops and he says, oh. <laughs> Lesson learned, right? People that have real cares and real responsibilities, right? Maybe find it a little bit more difficult to pray than a young monk who has basically no cares or no responsibilities. Uh, and so he learned a little bit of the wisdom of what that one little sign of the cross meant for that villager before he plopped down into his bed. So that's one side of the coin and we're all here. We're all in church and, you know, I commend us all for being here living intense, chaotic uh, lives filled with responsibilities and with worries and with cares. The other side of the coin is a question. What if, what if what we believe in our church, that this bread and this wine, what if it actually turns in to the body and blood of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is not only a human being who lived 2,000 years ago, but who is also the God and creator of the entire universe. And we get to partake of his life every Sunday when we come to church. What if that's actually true? How would that change our life? So on the one hand, we have chaos. And on the other hand, we have a deep and profound mystery and truth. And how do we put the two together? And actually, when the rubber hits the road, experience this incredible mystery that our church gives us and offers us in coming to worship and to partake of uh, the living God who is the creator of the universe. So I think that's the question and the, the challenge that we're going to try to tackle a little bit uh, today. Very good. But why would we even ask the question, right? Father John, why do people ask a question like that? What are why, your thoughts? Why, why do we uh, go to church? Yes. Well, I think it's a lot what uh, 
Father just brought out, it's, it's like a balancing act between your, your, what seems like the real world, uh, even though it's less real than the, re- the world here, and, uh, and it, it, they're, they're so busy, and so that's why the, the hymns say, lay aside all earthly cares that we may receive the King of all who comes invisibly escorted by the angelic host. So there is an aspect of that. Uh, in fact, one of the very first Orthodox liturgies I ever attended uh, as, a, as a visitor, and it was in a small military chapel, and the chaplain's wife was the choir, but she also had a couple of children running around. And, and uh, so she was trying to sing the chiru, that, that let us lay aside all earthly cares. And at that very moment, her children were just going all over the place. And she was trying to sing, but control her children at the same time. And I thought, that's a challenge. That's hard to do. Okay, well, I'll continue with my part of this. And that is, why do we participate in the Orthodox liturgy? And I want to highlight for this part, liturgy. I've had a couple of my, my sons who've visited, we've invited their friends, his, uh, my children's friends to come here, and then sometimes they've said, hey, why don't you come to my, my church? And my sons have often gone off to other, other churches, and it's, it's interesting to get their perspective, and, and uh, uh, so they would come back and say, wow, it was so different, the whole thing was only an hour, and it was, it was and uh, it, it, it was mostly the sermon, and the sermon was really good and the, and the music I had a rock band there and uh, was and they, they had a great guitarist and and uh, there was just so much and there's and so they were describing it but they their perceptions one of them kind of boldly said why can't why, why can't we won't be more like that and which what they were actually putting to not put but not understanding but they were understanding uh, the difference between liturgical worship and non-liturgical worship so here we are, uh, we pr- most assuredly worship liturgically. There's some good reasons for that. The first is God has proven in his scripture he loves liturgy. Look at the Old Testament. If you look back at the Old Testament and read through uh, s- some aspects of it, God, the, uh, there's a lot of meaning of the way God commanded his people to worship. He didn't leave it up to chance. He didn't leave it up to individual creativity. He says, here's what I want you to do. So he said, I want, when you build the, t- the tabernacle and then later the temple, I want you to have three parts to it. The outer court, which anybody can come to, the inner court, which is for the priests, and then the Holy of Holies, which is only for the high priest once a year. The, three, the breakdown of the, ta- the temple and the tabernacle, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the tabernacle and the temple, does that sound familiar? Narthex, nave, altar. Uh, they, had, uh, they had preset prayers. Have you ever heard of the Psalms? How often do we, we use preset prayers? We use the same prayers throughout our service that have been going on for uh, 1,800 years, the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, fourth century, changed very, very little down. So we have the same prayers over and over again. Well, God commanded his people in the Old Testament to pray according to the Psalms, primarily. And those are pre-written prayers put to music. Our prayers are put to music, just like then. They had priests. Their priests also wore assigned uh, uh, robes, not too different than the ones we wear. They have chanters. They had choirs. In fact, their chanters and choirs were in the temple 24 hours a day, taking turns, taking shifts to continuously praise God, even in the middle of the night when no one else was listening. They had an altar of incense. They had a laver, which was uh, very much like a baptismal, uh, uh, the, the baptismal uh, uh, font that we have here. All the features of liturgy in Hebrew worship are present in Orthodox temples, and also I highlight in heavenly worship. The writer of the Hebrews says, there are those, and this is from the book of Hebrews, there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and the shadow of heavenly things, who sure serve the copy and the shadow of heavenly things, as Moses divinely instructed. Isaiah gives us a good view of, in chapter 6 of a quick glimpse of what heaven is like. If you want to know what's heaven like, this is one of the two places to go. Isaiah saw this. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphim. 
one with six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. We have a hymn called Let Us Who Represent the Cherubim who sing the thrice holy hymn to the life-creating trinity, now lay aside all earthly cares. The cherubim, in other words, we, we symbolize heavenly worship. Our being here and our worship joins us with the constant worship by the angels. We join into that. They had incense both in, in Israel and also in heaven. We see this in Isaiah 6. One of the seraphim flew to me and having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and be, said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. What do you, th- and this was heaven, what was, do you think a live coal of charcoal was doing in heaven? That's what would they burned the incense with. Incense it was in, is also in heaven. The next verse, and the post of the door were shaken with the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. We have also the Chersayun hymn mentioned in the Old Testament. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of your glory. Does that sound familiar? (laughs) Uh, Does that hymn from the the angels sing, holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. We say that at every liturgy, uh, singing the triumphant hymn, shouting, proclaiming, and saying. We are still doing that. That's in heaven, and we, we experience it here. There's also the book of Revelation that has similar references to incense, and we see the four and twenty elders falling down and doing prostrations as, as part of their worship to God. And so we see the same, the same hymn being sung, holy, holy, holy. So my point of this for all of us is God intended us to be liturgically worshiping creatures. That's what we were designed for. What, what is our eternal vocation? Whatever your job or my job is uh, in here and now, it'll come to an end, but in heaven, what will we be doing? What will be our final vocation, our final job? And that is to worship God in his temple with the angels. And when we do that, we are, what we do here is we prepare for our heavenly destination. And we are participating in that heavenly destination. We don't have to wait for it to, to, to arrive there. We can begin to experience worship liturgically in God's house. And that's something that you will not see too many places else other than in the Orthodox Church and the Orthodox liturgy. Very good. Thank you. Um, so, so there is the life outside w- which we live every day with all the cares of life and all the uh, distractions and all the um, concerns and all the difficulties and then Sunday morning comes and we leave everything behind <coughs> so that we can come and be at the kingdom of God to foretaste the kingdom of God and that's why we're here and if we don't begin to do that it means we're missing something we're not doing something right we're not focusing on it we're not coming early enough so that we can reach the point, the apex, perhaps. We are not uh, attending to what the words are, perhaps. And we're missing out. So, in fact, the liturgy itself is structured in such a way that it will lead us into the highest level of spiritual development, spiritual (coughs) growth, that it will actually lead us exactly where the angels are and where they are when they... uh, worship God and we begin with taking care of all the things that are on our minds in the beginning of the liturgy if you come from the early from 10 o'clock the first thing we do is we say petitions in peace let us pray to the Lord for the peace from above let us pray to the Lord for the peace of the world we pray to the Lord for the abundance of the fruits of the earth we pray to the Lord for good weather we pray to the Lord we just lay out all the concerns that we have in front of God and then once we finish with petitions then we move into meeting christ christ comes the small entrance the gospel the word of god is brought to us and then it's read and we hear the word of god so we go to the second level which is first we empty our souls and our hearts 
from all the concerns, then we listen to Christ with a new um, mind, a clear mind, since we left everything behind. And then uh, we move into the third part, which is to approach the throne of God. And that's when we have the great entrance where the hymn says, let us lay us out all the cares of life and let us receive the King of all. And as we move into that section of the liturgy, then we are praying that the miracle of the change of the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ will happen so that we receive the King of all in us. We receive, we actually physically receive him, not only spiritually, but also physically receive, receive him so that he can transform us, so he can change us, so that he can heal us, he can perfect us. And as we do that, we are elevated to another level, to a higher level, to the highest level. We are foretasting the kingdom of God in the here and now. And that is why we should come to church. That's why we do come to church. That's why the church, the wisdom of the fathers of the church through the centuries has made this a focus for the existence of humanity because all life comes from God. And this is where that door opens so that we can enter into that existence so that we can receive that gift so that we can begin to live the kingdom of God on earth. Then of course you're gonna tell me, yes, but after we finish we go out and we do the same things, and we have the same concerns, and we sin again, and that's why there is next Sunday. <laughs> but if you skip two Sundays, then you have two weeks of those concerns, and those sins, and those things that will overwhelm you. And if you skip three Sundays, that is even worse. So, if we would have an argument as far as the why, we should be here every Sunday. The argument is very simple. To taste of the kingdom of God in the here and now. Any other thoughts, Father? I think we did it. <laughs> May God bless you and keep you.